I'm joined now by Mohamed Amersi, a businessman and significant donor to the Conservative Party. Mohamed has donated around about a half a million pounds to the Tories uh, and his partner has donated around £200,000. Uh, so, Mohammed, this week we've seen Rishi Sunak appoint a new party chairman, the London MP Greg Hans, and a new deputy in the form of Redwall MP Lee Anderson. Um, it feels a good moment to talk about um, some concerns you have with the way that the Conservative Party is run, particularly Conservative campaign headquarters, CCHQ. Take me through some of your concerns about the governance and the fundraising, fundraising side of the party. I love the party. I think they are a fantastic party. It's the oldest democratic party in the world and of course I want them to win. But if they do not attend to these issues then sadly instead of focusing on policies the electorate will be focused on sleaze and on um, all of these uh, scandals and issues that the party and its leadership has had to face as opposed to governing the country. So that's where I am at. Now on governance, on governance so you would have thought that being the oldest party in the world, we want to set a shining example to the rest of the world, right? Because everybody's looking at us to, 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 for leadership and to set an example. Alas, when you look at our party's constitution and our governance or ruling framework, it is so out of date uh, that it's, it's not even funny. So for example, the party has a board. Do any of us know who is on the board? Do we know how appointments are made to the board? Do we know what the remit of the board is? Do we know whether the board minutes are published so that they can be seen in a transparent fashion by all members of the public? The answer sadly is no, no to all of this. Should we not have a board that is transparently appointed where it is known who the members are it is known how they are elected and there are items on the agenda which I absolutely accept should be discussed and held in camera, like campaign strategy and all that, but there are a number of, maybe 80% of the items, is the right of the public to know what is being done because their lives are at stake here. So that's my first point. Then we look at party chairs. Should these be political appointees, just like Prime Minister Sunak did, or should they be uh, more on the form of meritocracy rather than chamocracy? So much of what this party has done in the last two years or three years that I've been involved with it is based on democracy. It's based on a notion of concentric circles so that people are on the wider circle and then as things happen, time goes by, they slightly get into the narrower, narrower, narrower and then there is a very small cabal that has got all the powers and that is the inner concentric circle. Is that the right way to govern the oldest part in the world? I would posit no. We then have a situation with the 1922 committee. They celebrated their 100 year anniversary this year. Ask yourself, do you actually know who is on the board of this committee? Do you know how decisions are taken? Is it right that on one leadership election they say that members the, 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 uh, the grassroots members of the party should vote on the leader and then three months later they say well no now it should only be open to the parliamentary party to vote. They cannot make these up as they go along. There has to be certainty. Now I know people will attack me for saying all of this because there are too many vested interests but if they really want to function efficiently then all this has to be done in a transparent, objective, easily understood way. Well, I think that there's a lot to unpack there, uh, and it's interesting what you say. Let's just take um, the the chairman um, uh, then, because that is something that other um, prominent donors and, and party figures have called for changes to. I'm thinking in particular of the new Democratic uh, Conservative Democratic organisation that's been started by uh, Lord Cruddus, uh, uh, very much a supporter of Boris Johnson. He and this group, they want to see party members vote for the chairman in future. Is that something you'd support? Um, so the, the question is, is it the parliamentary party? Is it the broader 160,000 people? Or is it um, the constituents? Um, I think that Democrat... So I believe that to go out to the constituents will be time consuming. It's something we should um, aspire to. But in the interim, I think it's very good that the chairs should be appointed by the 180,000 odd paid members of the party. 
uh, not the parliamentary party because that is too narrow a grouping and it should be the so it should also be the of the chair to be able to decide on candidate selection because there again my information is that more depends on democracy than depends on meritocracy so again on what basis are you going to choose candidates because ultimately um, if you haven't got an objective process, then it is you scratch my back and I scratch your back. Uh, yes, and this idea of um, quid pro quos, which I know you have um, been warning about for some time regarding the party. Um, and just to clarify, that's interesting that you say in the longer term, you'd like to see the entire country be able to have a vote on the Conservative Party chairman. By that, I mean the, the those that are Tory party supporters, not necessarily... Uh, fee-paying members, but one has to look into that in a little bit more depth. It cannot be that somebody who is not a Tory would have a say in who the Tory party chair is. So nobody who is leaning towards Labour or Lib Dems obviously should not have a say. But they have to make this thing... You know, I go back to Pro President Obama's election and how his um, advisor, Dan Axelrod, decided to go and collect the $1, the $5 subscriptions, the $5 gifts, to make sure that his election was absolutely as wide, as broad, because this is, at the end of the day, what really brings about the best democracy in the world, that people should have a complete buy-in and not just have an elite that would rule the lives of so many. That's interesting. I think many on uh, the Labour side of uh, Parliament might warn that when they tried that with £3 registered supporters, they ended up with a lot of um, entryists from the left, the wider left, but not necessarily of the Labour Party, coming to have a vote uh, and therefore picking a candidate much more to the left of the party in Jeremy Corbyn uh, than the mainstream uh, Labour Party might have wanted. Wouldn't that be a concern for the Conservatives? So, um, again, there is a question of um, how do you ensure that this is not open to abuse? And that's a much, for a much longer discussion, but I believe that there are safeguards that you could easily build into the system um, that should uh, stop it from being abused in this way. It's a bit like, in a way, um, when you use um, electronic voting and have the risk of maybe artificial robots um, uh, pretending that they are a human and voting. So I'm not saying that it's easy, but I believe that there are safeguards that one could put into place to avoid that. Uh, and tell me then about the 1922 committee. You're concerned about the way that's operating. Do you think that MPs in the Conservative Party have too much power and the 1922 committee has too much power? I, I wondered in particular what you felt about the MPs ousting two successive Conservative leaders in the past couple of years. So, um, again, it boils down to their performance in some respects. OK, um, and it's a tough situation because if they have the power, um, then we say they shouldn't have the power. And if they don't have the power, then um, we say, well, you know, there is no way that these people who are in power can be removed from power. So on the two instances that you cite, sadly, in both of those instances, so much of public opinion, so much of parliamentary time was being spent in dealing with what I would say, personal issues, rather than governing post-Brexit, post-Covid, post-Ukraine, on some of the most difficult uh, challenges that we are facing today. With um, uh, the last Prime Minister, well, her policies were clearly um, uh, shown by the financial markets to be absolutely unfit for purpose. Now, there may be a debate as to whether low tax, high tax, we want to head towards, but the question is not that, the question is in today's crisis, where we have a living crisis, cost of living crisis I mean, we have um, supply chain issues, we have energy related issues, that in those sort of situations is it right that we cut taxes and borrow more money? If we did want to borrow money, there was a time two years ago when interest rates were at zero. And I asked the Bank of England, I asked the Chancellor, why did they not borrow £100 billion then, when the cost of borrowing would have been next to nothing? But alas, that opportunity was not taken up, and we are in the situation today. So I think that um, while her strategies may in a short term have been somewhat flawed, perhaps in the medium to long term they would have borne out. And this is the debate we are having today. But 
the fact that she created the pound, the fact that she created the economy, meant that the, 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 the public would have absolutely lost confidence in the government if that change would not have happened. Now, let's move on to um, fundraising. Uh, I know you have concerns there. Um, tell me, uh, what are the reforms you'd like to see introduced to Conservative Party fundraising? OK, so um, I, I have uh, thought long and hard about this, Lucy, because clearly, on the one hand, I've been the beneficiary of a system, and then I've also at times been the victim of the system. So I can see it from both sides. OK, I would recommend that, that we have three different layers of scrutiny. Uh, anybody that is thinking of donating under the Electoral Commission um, disclosure limit, which is 7,500, should be spoken to by a party um, administrator, understand who they are, understand the basic checks, which is your taxpayer ID number and your residence evidence or whatever, and then that should be, by and large, sufficient. Anybody that is doing between seven and a half, and I would put the limit at 50,000 pounds, requires them to fill in a complete due diligence questionnaire that is demonstrating how they made the money, um, is it all legit, and then secondly, that there is no quid pro quo, there is no expectations from them giving money, and that is clearly understood. The reason why this piece of paper will be very useful is in case if later on some problem happens, then the party can point to the questionnaire and say we have a signed statement from the gentleman or lady in question and if then they breach what they undertake then there are separate grounds then to um, name them and shame them and then i would finally recommend anybody giving more than fifty thousand pounds has to go through a rigorous due diligence check and maybe that should be done by an outside organization that has the tools to do I would say public um, domain due diligence, not anything that is intrusive or is uh, not public domain or, or opposite, as we call it, uh, open source intelligence. Um, and then after that, decisions have to be made as to whether this is somebody that we are interested in taking money from. Now, this was my thoughts as of the last, uh, say, one month ago. I've now refined this to add one more layer, which is very, very important. We have seen question marks being asked of senior political leaders as to their tax status. Some of them are resident, some of their spouses are resident but not domiciled. We've seen offshore company structures bring down party chairs. Um, and, and so I would also say that it's time right now for a fundamental look into this issue that anybody that wants to occupy senior political position in this country or donate large sums of money, and by that I mean above 50,000 pounds a year, they have to be fully tax compliant in the UK, their family has to be fully tax compliant, in that they should be both resident, domiciled, and no offshore structures. Otherwise, we're going to have press like yours looking into these affairs, and then it's a distraction for whoever that person or he or she is to have to answer questions about their private tax affairs. In no other country do I know that you can have your domicile outside, you can have a bunch of offshore structures, whether you say you've given it to discretionary management to some third party asset manager or not is neither here nor there, end of the day, but you just would not be allowed. You know, President Obama, mm -hmm. President Biden would yeah. not have offshore companies that they own. So, so tell me, are you concerned at the moment that there are donors to the party that are potentially undermining its reputation because they are not appropriate people to be giving money to British political parties? Um, that's a, uh, I'm saying something slightly different. Appropriate is, uh, is a subjective test. All I'm saying is that there has to be an objective test if their heart, their mind, their soul their connectivity is not a hundred percent with this country then do you really want them to be able to control your democracy and your government even if they're not doing anything wrong even if they can show that they're not doing anything wrong. I, I think it's i think it's a fascinating point but i'm just trying to get um underneath why why you're concerned at the moment that that's happening are you that there are people that aren't that connected to the uk that are having some kind of undue influence Yes, because we have seen um, all the interference from foreign states and how they have interfered in our democracy 
not only do I you know the, the usual ones at the moment are Russia and uh, and the Central Asia, but there is question marks about the Middle East. And as the emerging markets or developing markets of Africa come up, Asia come up, Latin America come up, we will see more and more of this. What is their reason for donating here? Why is it that they still maintain offshore structures where they make money in ways which we would find questionable and then channel that money into our system? Is it that this is a foreign uh, uh, government or a foreign state or a foreign player wanting to find ways to influence our democracy? We've seen so many examples of this in the press and I applaud the press for investigating and calling all this out. But there will be far more. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So either we nip it in the bud now, or then we continue fielding these questions for forever. And just finally, uh, Mohammed, uh, I know you've coined this term access capitalism. Uh, you've been concerned that uh, there has been a sort of sense of quid pro quo. People are asked to, or it's suggested they could donate money to the party, and they get something in return for that. Tell me about your concerns around that specific um, trend as you see it. So um, the, the fundamental question that should be asked by these people doing the due diligence is, so you want to give money, is there an expectation from you as to what you want in return? Now, that return could be as simple as recognition, so a knighthood, a CBE, or a House of Lords peerage or whatever. That is the... the uh, most And just, just to be clear, you think that the party has been trading these honours or peerages in return for cash? Well, I'm not suggesting it. I'm just um, outlining what uh, I think it was the Guardian that said that out of the last 18 treasurers... 17 of them are in the Lords or have been recognized in some form or shape. It's an evidence-based statement. It's not something I'm dreaming up or other people are dreaming up. There is, there is a backup for it. So then you've got to ask yourself, why are people giving money? Is it because they want something or is it because they want to do something? I would say it is the fact that they want to do something, improve the country, Post-Brexit, we are quite isolated, we are quite alone. We will need all the brains, we will need all the help that we can muster to ensure that we retain a powerful force in the world going forward. And this requires people to come and say, we want to give money, but we don't want anything for it. We want to be given the chance to do something besides give money. Listen to us. We want to help you. And just finally, uh, Mohammed, I wanted to ask your reaction to the appointment of Greg Hans and in particular the appointment of Lee Anderson as deputy uh, chairman uh, this week. Um, Lee Anderson's made um, some controversial comments about uh, people using food banks being unable to budget. We've just heard in the last 24 hours his call for the return of the death penalty. Um, what do you make of him as a choice uh, of deputy chairman of the party? So I was, um, I mean, frankly, I don't have, I haven't had dealings, extensive dealings with either of them. So um, I carry out my, my response. But I would have thought that the time was absolutely right now, given the scandals we've had of the three or four last chairs, that they should have brought a seasoned politician. So names that were being paraded were like Paul Scully, like Penny Mordon, people who have been in power for long, understand the the, the nuts and bolts understand the roots of the party, are recognized by the public as unimpeachable in any way. That's what should have been done. But as I said, this is the Prime Minister's decision. He took it and we have to work with what's best. I just hope that we do not yet have another change in chair before the elections because that would be um, very, very disheartening in some respects, you know. And then there are one or two other points, if I may make, before... So um, I am uh, fully supportive of um, uh, Prime Minister Sunak's, the, the, his drive on integrity, his drive on transparency, his hopefully focus on Nolan principles and all that. I think that's hugely admirable. But he has to do, going forward, not what is easy, but what is right, which means he has to have the courage of his convictions and fight vested interests so that at least the public will remember him for somebody who had values, who did not compromise and didn't do deals just to make sure that he stays in power and the party stays in power. We are in a crisis mode. 
the question now is not what is good for conservative or labor or for rishi or whoever the, the question really is what does the country need to get out of this okay now this will be very controversial but i want to make one final point which is so much has been said about brexit and oh i was a brexiteer you see but i was what i call a soft brexiteer i wanted to retain the optionality in case if it was found that we had made a mistake collectively because as they say making a mistake is not a mistake making no mistake is a mistake and repeating a mistake is a very big mistake so if i were rishi i would say look today the issue on brexit is the tories do not want to discuss it because they feel that it's they who brought this on to the country so we can't look into it and labor is afraid that if they open this up again they could lose the red wall votes so we are in this log jam where the country is suffering i believe that there should be a fundamental independent analysis commissioned by by prime minister sunak to look into brexit what has worked what has not worked and what are we going to do about it it's it's not about party partisan politics now it's what for the what is needed by the country as a whole should be have done it because otherwise it looks like this was a vision without action and visions without action are daydreams as such and then when you have action which is without vision it's a nightmare and that's what we are facing today understood and just to draw you on the um the question about the chairman so interesting you would have liked to have seen someone you believe has a bit more experience perhaps take the chairmanship role instead of Greg Hans. You mentioned Paul Scully, you mentioned Penny Mordaunt. Can I just return to that question about Lee Anderson as the deputy chairman? Are you concerned by some of the public pronouncements he's made, including around food bank use and, and perhaps the death penalty? Or, or do you think that he is a suitable choice? No, I am uh, naturally, I, as I said, I've never met him. I've not spoken to him. So he will feel that my remarks are somewhat out of place. But I would say that the time has come to avoid controversy. Now, you know, one would have to ask why was he selected? I understood he was selected to make sure that the red wall votes stay in place. Is this what it takes to keep the red wall votes? And if it is, I would say this goes fundamentally against the grain of our society as a whole. So again, they should not be engaged in, in petty, statements just to win votes that's not the approach what should be done is really speaking for the whole nation being responsible in what you say and making sure that you avoid controversy otherwise we get into the same situation we've been through now mm -hmm. in the last 18 months and so it was a mistake to put lee anderson in this position given his penchant for i mean uh, look the prime minister would know far better than me um, as would the chair, if they were involved in the selection of the deputy chair, as to what the real criteria were when they decided to choose this. If I knew nothing else, and if this was a free vote, and then to see him say these things, I would say it's not a great choice. But there may be other underlying reasons that I'm not aware of.